Oops, I did it again. I really gotta stop doing this. The folks at Vivo sent this my way. The Vivo X100 Pro to take on a test drive, share some thoughts, and I have. I've done a video already comparing it to the X90 Pro from last year. I really dig it when PR, they seem excited about the product that's coming out. I got an email from Vivo last year saying, we think we made the best phone of 2023. And technically, it was released right at the end of last year. But this is also a phone meant to do battle over the course of phones released through 2024. Using this phone for over a month now, Vivo has a strong claim here, this being one of the best phones of 2024, and 2024 just got started. I got the phone, I did a comparison, and you might not have heard as much about it on my YouTube channel. I really gotta stop doing this. You haven't heard as much about this phone because I've just been using it to do other projects. I have been neglectful in my reviewer duties. I haven't been testing it and reviewing it, it just sort of joined the Xiaomi 13 Ultra as a proper production camera and a mobile field editing computer. Whatever else I might say about a phone, what, what little tidbits I might share, little nooks and crannies that you didn't think about, I can't think of any higher praise for my needs than to say, I've been using it more than I've been reviewing it, even if that isn't quite fair to the company that made the phone and send it to me. I really need to start putting tags on my videos. You know, this B-roll was shot by this phone, blah, blah, but I digress. The X100 Pro is not going to be the bestest phone of the year based on all phones at all price tags. What Vivo is doing is very similar to what I like about OnePlus right now, taking a targeted approach to specific features and driving home a brutally competitive option against other premium devices. OnePlus exists to undercut those premium devices on price. This phone exists to more closely match the price, but crushes on better technology, photography, and compute power. Now we can talk about all the other aspects of a premium tier phone, but in getting my bias out of the way up front, how a phone looks out of the case, you know, how the manufacturer's skin performs, or does it, does it feel really nice in the hand? I can comment on all those factors and still highly recommend a device, despite a few issues I don't entirely love. The Vivo draws some of that out of me. I would greatly prefer Vivo move to a flat screen screen and flat sides, like the iQ12. When it's a camera-focused device, I want the absolute best grip I can get on it. You don't get that with a curved screen. I also don't love how low the fingerprint sensor is on a tall aspect ratio phone. And again, I like what OnePlus is doing better there. And while the software has gotten a fresh coat of paint, Fun Touch is still one of the less fun skins out there for our phones. It's feeling a lot more like kind of a mashup of Android 11 and some material you design. And not all of it works if we're considering aesthetic. If one of the major fads of this year is AI, there's precious little in your face AI on this device. No fancy subject detection mode in your photo gallery, no fancy editing modes. The AI baked into the camera tech is a lot more subtle at the time you capture a photo or video, but there's less novelty when sharing or editing. And for all those issues, I kinda just can't care that much when I pick it up and I shoot some video, I cut it up and I render it out. This is a platform that's putting insane mobile production capabilities in my pocket. We keep saying things like that in tech reviews. We show you a Geekbench score and you're supposed to nod along. That Geekbench number is bigger than the, the other number, so that's more better. Quick tangent. I have an older but pretty beefy workstation that I use to edit on at home. It's a Threadripper and I just put in a 4070 Ti and I've seen a significant uptick in GPU rendering using DaVinci Resolve. Why bring that up here now? I don't know, probably no reason, but Try to remember what I just said. Back to the phone, I can show you the Bigly Geekbench scores and they don't mean anything. They do not relate at all to real world app performance. Whoa, the Dimensity 9300 in the Vivo scored 8% higher in multi-core performance than the 8 Gen 3 did in the iQ12. How exciting, 8% better. Pause this video now, go down to my comments and tell me what does an 8% higher Geekbench score mean in the apps and games you really use on your phone? I want you to conceptualize this or quantify it. How does that improve your experience? That score has to mean something. It has to be able to predict some difference in capability or workload. What does that mean 
and why should we use that number to help influence what phone someone should buy? I'll, I'll wait here for a sec while while you run down, but but go ahead and pause. Let, let me let me hear your thoughts. I'm sure you all delivered some great comments. Let me just show you what I'm talking about. If you're a mobile content creator and you use an app like LumaFusion to cut down short videos, let's say you render in a decent quality for YouTube streaming, 4K video files, the difference looks like this. Rendering a one minute project with transitions and a soundtrack and a watermark, the Vivo with the MediaTek chip gets it done 40% faster than the iQoo using a Qualcomm chip. That 8% difference in Geekbench is translating to a 40% difference in real world performance. Now I want you to just kind of think back. You, you remember how I mentioned my workstation? It was just like, it was like a minute ago. If I match the edits as closely as I can to what I do on my phone tests, and I render to a similar quality as the phone, and I even scale back like the audio bitrate, my Threadripper, with a 4070 Ti, completes a similar render and delivers a similar final video quality in roughly 21 seconds. I have a video editing platform in my pocket that can render faster than my ludicrously large server cased workstation can. Can I edit a little faster on a keyboard and mouse with my nicer dual monitor setup? Yes, I can, but I also don't have to transfer files if I shot the footage from the Vivo and I can be editing as I shoot. I don't need to wait and go home and dump footage to the workstation and then get started. Instead, using a phone to create our little social media videos, I can be creating the timeline while I'm shooting the timeline, and then I can render it faster than if I waited to go home and start my editing. Because cameras like these have started replacing my mirrorless cameras out in the field. All over 2023, almost all of my B-roll came from Xiaomi and Vivo phones. Hardware at this price. I think Vivo learned an important lesson from the X90 Pro. That was kind of the crux of my comparison video, and we see the result of that education on the X100 Pro. The triple sensor layout is the most cost-effective way to cover a wide range of focal lengths. The main sensor is really good at doing a two times crop, and the larger telephoto sensor, it sacrifices some of the farther zoom reach, but delivers much better IQ in a wider variety of lighting conditions. Apple, Google, and Samsung are using roughly 1 over 1.3 inch type main camera sensors on their most expensive phones. Vivo is using a 1 inch type sensor and that is significantly larger. Not just better for soaking up more light, it does change the more photographic elements of our scene. Shallower depth of field, a more photographic look, uh, better noise when you're shooting raw files. That look and feel is just a little more photographic with without having to turn to software background blurring filters. I've been talking about these AI features sort of mystically. We can show a brief example. This is using the new cinema mode on the Vivo X100 Pro. It's a really breezy day, so I have no idea if this audio is even gonna come out well, yet actually using the microphones here on the phone. But it gives us some really exciting capabilities, uh, kind of track a subject and then edit the background blur in post. It's really cool being able to see this kind of dynamic change being done on device. Like this is local processing on the phone. It's not going up to a cloud to be reprocessed or anything like that. It's a very subtle effect, and it gives, still gives us some capabilities for changing up like the style of the bokeh. It is a really interesting development because I'm typically the guy who's looking at just like the main sensor performance saying like, well, this is the natural focus fall off. This is the natural bokeh. But these new AI tools are getting us to a better place if we want to incorporate something that looks just a little more cinematic, just a little more photographic. I'm still inclined to point out though that if we have bigger and better sensors, then those sensors are probably feeding better data to the software that will enhance uh, sort of uh, editing tools like these. Ditto the companion sensor. Samsung is now using a one over 2.6 inch type sensor on their telephoto, that's a nice step up. But Vivo is using a larger half inch sensor on their telephoto. And all three of Vivo sensors are higher resolution with matched capabilities for high res output super raw stacked DNG images and 4K video. Importantly, Vivo now joining that short list of phones that can shoot 4K 60 video and switch lenses while recording a single clip. It feels a lot like one continuous super zooming lens. Google deserved a lot more credit for getting that done first, but I'm really excited to see that feature showing up on more phones because that's kind of a big deal. And I wish more Android manufacturers would lean into this philosophy. Your rear cameras should really feel like one 
cohesive camera, not a separate collection of sensors and optics. The user should not be thinking about the flowchart of what feature they can use with which sensor. They should just be focused on capturing the moment. Now, Vivo's camera app is still one of the sloppier collections of features and modes. I, I have a soft spot in my heart for that because it kind of reminds me a little of LG's camera app from back in the day. But I feel few phones really reward the user for taking the time to learn about their camera app and get a feel for it. At once, the Vivo is a solid point and shoot solution with some of the fastest image processing I've ever seen. And at the other end, it can be a proper competitor to more manual shooters like a Sony Xperia. It's just got a camera app that will be wholly unfamiliar to folks who are more familiar with iPhones and Galaxies. That's where Vivo's AI and their new co-processor really shine. Incredibly fast HDR processing, fast night mode shots, and subtle but important improvements to the autofocus. Now, I'll have a lot more to say about these cameras. I'm still finishing up my samples to do a camera deep dive. That's going to be exclusive to my uh, Patreon, patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. But I think a lot of this can be summed up by saying a hardware advantage like these sensors and co-processor make for a formidable photography and video performer. Lastly, I have been impressed with the battery life. I don't think this phone will go down as the battery life champ this year. It's running a crazy SOC that can rival my desktop in video rendering performance, but it's much better behaved than I was expecting it to be. It's really good at the daily driver stuff. MediaTek's claim that you can finish a short task faster and then the phone will return to a low power state, that claim seems to be accurate. It's also really good at at medium bursts of high level use. Video editing and audio mixing and the phone can get decently high level jobs done so quickly you'll rarely feel any thermal throttling. If you force a longer job where the CPU has to work consistently over minutes and minutes of a single task, we can see areas where the HN3 can catch this phone and overtake it. Now, if you'd like to see more of the charts and graphs on what those performance differences really look like beyond an Antu 2 score, that's also over on the Patreon. I'm not guessing when I talk about performance. I really do some silly thermal throttling tests. Running those tests, I am skeptical that many people are going to naturally encounter those situations where they're throttled so heavily that they'd wish they had an HN3 instead. Definitely possible, not very likely. And even if the phone is burning more of your battery at maximum performance, it also charges crazy fast. I'm sure there's wireless charging and even fast wireless charging, but just plugging in a cable with the charger that's included in the price of the phone that comes in the box. Plugging in for a couple minutes will give you a whole day of runtime out in the field. As a brief comparison, and something that I've talked about in some of my IQ videos too, I'd still likely give Qualcomm a slight edge in gaming, but that's also phone dependent. The IQ, for example, can keep slightly more consistent frame rates in a really graphics intense situation. Like I'm now starting to use Alien Isolation as a test of phone performance, trying to see if I can max out over 100 frames per second. The iQ12 does that a little bit better than the Vivo X100 Pro. But the flip side of that, you know, OnePlus uses the same chip as the iQ, but I think OnePlus is managing the graphics in games a little bit more aggressively. And you can see a more fluid representation of that game on the Vivo, than on the OnePlus. This is difficult stuff to get in and test because of all of the differences that we see in game options and performance modes, and they make a stark difference in the player experience. You know, someone might value more battery life while gaming away from a charger. Other people might just wanna see 100 frames per second in alien isolation, regardless of how fast that might drain their battery. So it's good to have options, but it's really difficult to get a handle on what those differences look like across a wider collection of games games. Regardless, I feel this is a critical omission from most premium tier phones in this day and age. All of our high performance pocket computers should have some kind of charge pass through mode or battery separation. It's popular on gaming phones where you plug in, but the battery isn't really being topped off. Instead, the phone bypasses the battery, which keeps the battery cooler, and then the charge just sort of stays in place. The power from the charger is being used to power the phone. The Vivo is a prime candidate for that kind of capability, especially considering the peak power draw of the Dimensity 9300. It would be nice to see a feature like that here. Wrapping this all up, I've been rambling on long enough. There's a charm here based on the price to performance. I would imagine 
a Vivo X100 Pro Plus model. I mean, it might come out soon and it could have a few better tech bits. Maybe they'll go with a proper quad camera setup and maybe they'll use that awesome max fingerprint sensor that I loved on the X80 Pro. But if I spent more on that phone and it has the Qualcomm chip and it doesn't cut up my video as fast, well, that would be a downgrade for me. I wouldn't feel as good about spending more on those other bits. That kind of makes this phone feel special even for a few of its faults. I literally can't get anything like this from Google, Samsung, or Apple. And we talk about work and professional use and productivity. And if that means documents or sketching, then a Galaxy Note, that's a no brainer. Get that S Pen. Or if your phone is a personal assistant communication device, Google takes a win with the assistant and call screening. But for photo and video work out in the field and for capabilities that would enable me to leave a really nice mirrorless camera and a decently high spec laptop at home and I could still get all my work done, that's where Vivo came to play. I love packing light, leaving thousands of dollars of production equipment in my office and I'm probably getting the job done faster than if I had traveled with cameras and lenses and batteries and monitors and a beefy laptop. The X series phones from Vivo have not been pitched as all rounder average consumer daily driver devices. And it's making that claim in most regions at a price point that's doing battle against some bumped up storage tiers for an iPhone 15 plus. It's really tough to find any significant fault in Vivo's Pro phone this year. But of course, I would love to hear from you. Drop me some comments down below this video. Who do you think's really taken that Pro tier? Right, we're talking premium phones, not the ultra expensive phones. Who's pulling out an early lead for 2024 and who are you excited to see do battle with the X100 Pro? Cause this phone is gonna be making regular appearances on my channel. Even if I'm not holding the phone up, that means you're probably seeing the video from this phone. I expect the tastiest of hot takes down in the comments below this video and maybe smash bell icon on your way down because algorithm. As always, thanks so much for watching, sharing, subscribing, however you choose to subscribe to this channel or my blog. All the support lately has been absolutely fantastic. Those of you who are clicking on links in the descriptions of my videos or hitting my home site, somegadgetguy.com, or maybe you've joined the list of names scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon. That's patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. This list basically represents the coolest tech pals in the universe, and they get exclusive access to my camera deep dives and a lot of the testing articles that I'm writing as I'm setting the phones up and I'm getting them ready to review. They're basically the coolest geeks in the universe, so I hope you'll check them out. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet, at some gadget guy, basically everywhere, but these days I'm trying to spend a bit more time on the Mastodons, sharing cool photo samples over on the Flickers, and a little less so on the Facebooks and the Instagrams, and definitely not on the Twitters, Ugh. and I will catch you all on the next review.